big stairs, my resistance beats me cold. Can you help me go the distance? Hello, God. Hello, hello. These old waters come to pieces. Can we fix it? Easier time. They can bond it. Jaws in crazies. We're so selfish. Hurrell and pride, we fight and kill each other in your name, defending you. Do you love some more than others? We're so lost and confused. Hello, God, are you out there? Can you hear us? Are you listening anymore? Hello, God, if you see long speaking times, can you help us lie? glad to see everyone this morning, particularly those who have um, managed to be in this um, holy sanctuary again after about five months of um, lockdown. Um, we want to appreciate God um, for this and we also want to welcome um, our virtual audience. Uh, we want to say welcome to the house of God. When we say the house of God, both the physical house of God and the virtual house of God, we pray God to bless us all throughout um, this hour. And we want to appreciate the preludes there uh, that's been given starting with um, the uh, opening duet by the organ and piano voluntary. Um, we, we thank God for that and we also thoroughly enjoy the violin solo by Sister Comfort. Um, she played um, Holy Art Thou by G.F. Handel and she topped, up, topped that up with um, Hallelujah and one or two more in that medley. I'm sure we thoroughly enjoy that. Uh, and then finally we had the vocal solo by Brother Dakbo, Hello God by Dolly Parton. We're going to now join our voices together by singing some songs, starting with um, SSNS 229, Great is the Lord, and Sister Comfort will be leading us in the singing. We sing through the verses 1 to 4 after the tune by the organist.
our praise is in Jesus' name. Our next song would be number 571. 571. 57. Sorry, 583. Beg your pardon, 583. And we are going to sing through the verses. Please join to sing with us from wherever you are from verses 1 to 5. After it's your mom. us to have a closer walk with him. Our next song would be from SS&S, number 571. 571. More about Jesus. Oh, 
song before prayer is uh, a chorus from CGS number five. Chorus from CGS number five, let the beauty of Jesus be seen in me. We are going to stand up to sing that chorus and we are singing it two times over. And then we shall remain standing to be led in congregational prayer. Let's stand up to sing. here 
in our Pekan Sanctuary. And we know we have many more online that are enjoying the service too. We pray that the Lord will bless you too. Amen. At 5 p.m., remember to join us as we shall have also online evening revival service. We want to extend our great appreciation to the welfare team of this church, the national level, for the success of the business innovation program that took place yesterday. All those who took part and all those who managed to um, participate online will agree with me that um, that was a great and a successful program. We greatly appreciate the effort of our welfare team that God used to put that program together. May the Lord bless them. Daily morning prayers will continue as we've been doing before now, Monday through to Friday, 7.30 through to 8.30, and then evening prayer meeting also will continue Monday to Thursday, 7.30 to 8.30 at different households. We want to encourage everyone to please make use of our daily devotional from our website, Portland Headquarters. We just finished that longest book in the Bible. The book of Psalm 119. We just finished with that yesterday and we are still continuing. So we want to encourage you to make sure you make use of that during your um, prayer meeting, either in the morning or in the evening. You can tap into that. Then on Friday, we will have combined prayer meeting at 8 to 9, and that is going to be the online one. But every other one before then is going to be a different household. Saturday prayer meeting also 8 to 10 in the morning. Next Sunday, should Jesus tarry, according to our annual calendar of events, the beginning of our annual revival week should commence next Sunday, the 23rd of August, um, through to the end of August, the 30th of August. Um, we're going to go ahead with that program too. The representative of this ministry and we have all met and we have agreed that we should continue with that um, annual event and more information about that will be given to you next Sunday, Lord willing, when we have the first day of that revival week. But for next Sunday, Lord willing, elementary Sunday school at 9.30, as we had this morning, junior and other Sunday school at 10, devotional service at 11.15, young adult service, be at 2.30, and then revival and evangelistic service at 5 p.m. As announced before now, send in your testimonies, live recordings, two minutes, which we can make use of when we meet together virtually so that we can play that too um, on our um, archived services that we are making use of for now in the evening. Special announcement for our people in Bexley. It's going to be your turn next Sunday, by God's grace. Before now, we have not invited everyone as we have done in Birmingham as well as here in Peckham. We have not done that yet in Bexley. So for next Sunday, we are extending invitation to all our members of Bexley Branch Church to um, come to church, those who would like to. We've been doing this through a registration process, just as we did in Birmingham and as we did. Even here today, we have um, about 30 people in total here in our uh, Peckham branch for this morning. So please, for those who would like to attend as well in Bexley, register your intention to do so, so that this can be controlled and planned in an orderly fashion. We want the registration to be in place. So for uh, Bexley uh, members, register with Brother Olaito. Brother Olaito. We plan also to have a similar thing for our um, members in Manchester, but as you will have perhaps seen from the message I posted during the course of this week, uh, this last week, we will not be able to do that uh, so soon because of the local lockdown um, operating now in Manchester. And for our Manchester members, that the grace of God, as we are praying that the Lord will um, take away COVID-19, by God.
God's grace, we plan that you too will have the opportunity to be in your sanctuary again in your number and then um, have a live service as we are having now. But we pray that God will bless you as you join online yet. Okay, we we'll continue with the service um, with our first special, which is a vocal solo by Sister Yemisi, Whispering Hope by Alice Orton. Uh, Sister Yemisi will come forward to give us that solo. Well, we have a screen for our soloist here, so she will take off her mask and come before the screen to render that solo. And then we have the Bible, Bible reading which has been selected from the uh, First Peter chapter 3, verses 1 to 9. And then the last special, another vocal solo to be given by Brother Godwin, proved by your life by P. W. Brown, and follow with a word of exhortation before we have the closing congregational song, which is for the altar call, um, taken from the same book that we were used, we have we, we have been using this morning, um, SSNS 473, just as I am, and then we have the closing prayer at the end um, by Brother Godwin. As usual. Be sure to take time to pray at the altar in your home. For us there in the church, we only have two people on the altar for the men, two people for the altar for the ladies. But of course, every place now can be an altar. Wherever we have the opportunity to kneel down and pray, we know that the Lord will certainly answer our prayer. God bless you all.
souls of many a faith and a creed. But my old Bible tells me, read it now. Narrow is the path to life indeed. Oh, yes. If you say you love the Savior, in his word you will always live. If you say your sins are forgiven and gone, then prove it by the life you Let's open our Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 1. Our focus will be a lot on 1 Peter this morning. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1 and verses 3 through to 6. Verse 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, Verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Verse 6, wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations. Well, I guess um, it, it is kind of supposed that um, this Peter's first epistle was written shortly after Paul, the apostle, was martyred, after his martyrdom. At that time, the churches that Paul helped to establish were going through a lot of fiery trials. They were going through a bit of hard time, if you like. It was around about, um, Bible scholars say it was around about 35 years after Pentecost, and the church was going through hard persecution at this time. And at this time, the Roman emperor then, Nero, the Roman emperor, the emperor of Rome, was persecuting the church. And to cover up his own guilt at the time, he accused 
the Christians of burning Rome. Rome was on, on fire, and the Christians were accused of that, um, that tragedy, if you like. And in trying to get back, he inflicted a lot of pain at that time. It's a traumatic period for the Christians. Some of them were dipped in tar and used as torches, if you like. It used as torches to light the gardens of Nero. Imagine torch lights. Human beings use as torch lights. Torches to light the garden of Nero after he threw an outdoor party. So basically, people who were being burnt were that. They were tied onto his chariot and dragged through the streets of Rome until they were dead. Some of them were thrown to lions at the time. And history also makes us realize that um, at that time, some of them were tied up in leather bags and thrown into water, and the leather somehow shrank. Those bags shrank, and the Christians were squeezed to death. Um, amongst this and many, many other um, ways or delicate ways was used by Nero to actually persecute the Christian church at the time. And no wonder, most of these times, the Bible scholars refer to the Christians there, there because they had to run for their lives. And that's why it was said the Christians who were in exile. They were scattered through many provinces, many places at this um, very, very hard time. And that was the conditions prevailing at that time um, of the Christian church, in the, in the early church. Um, Peter's focus now at this time, well, they were going through this hardship, through this, he was now attracting the Christians, drawing their attention to focus on that which is of value to the Christians. What which is of value to the Christians is where he was kind of attracting their attention. And we'll, of course, read a little bit more on that. But the key verse in this whole scripture was in that first Peter chapter 3 verse 4 when he was referring to the hidden man of the heart. That is the bit that is of great value to the priest. I missed what they were going through. I guess, in a sense, we can say what coronavirus pandemic has brought to the world is brought untold hardship to the world. Many, if in our beloved country, UK, which you know we thank God for the advancement of medical science research, and you know it, if about 46,000 have lost their lives, if in the great, great countries like the USA, the might of technology, you're looking at about 170,000 losing their lives. And if you look at places like Mexico, over 50,000, Brazil, over 100,000, etc. I mean, you will agree with me that this is a time when the world is going through hardships. And Christians are not exempted. I mean, tr truly, sometimes we thank God that locally, God has spared us. But when we look at the church of God in a global sense, even the apostolic faith, I remember listening to a prayer meeting that was being led, at least in the Portland church, and there was prayer by, I think it was maybe a saint in one of our churches in the, in the States, in the southeast coast, in the east coast, who lost their lives through COVID-19. So we're not exempt, but we thank God for his mercies. So I think the point being made here is it's a time of great, great distress. And I miss this all. Many have lost their jobs. Many who actually managed to be on the follow scheme, when that's all lifted in October, nobody knows the fate, uh, fate of such people, whether they're going to be reabsorbed back or that, is that the end in terms of working. Many are going through mental health issues because of um, the hardship it's caused. Many who've lost their lives, of course. And um, the loved ones, we can imagine what is causing. It's a time when deep empathy needs to be, of course, shown to one another. And we thank God as a church, we're doing the best we can. As Christians, we're sharing that, we're sharing love and concern because that's the time that these things um, kind of bring for us. And on top of that, you can imagine when Christians, where they drive their soccer from, it's that fellowship of the saints, isn't it? That fellowship. And we all know that there's nothing as good as in-person fellowship, face-to-face -face fellowship. But we, we thank God that um, we still 
enjoy virtual fellowship nevertheless. But we can't compare it. It's like when we talk about communication, there is nothing as great as face-to-face -face communication. So, but that is the time in which we're in. And amidst all this, we're hearing that even the second wave, we're hearing maybe in Spain, France, that, that verge, we don't know what's going to happen. We heard, Isaac was mentioning during the announcement about uh, Manchester and I think at four, five other cities, you know, they've gone back to lockdown mode. So the future is very, very uncertain. We don't know. Of course we trust God and we believe God for the best. There's no doubt about that. But I think the reality is, I think we can link into such a time that a Christian church, although what they faced at this time was far harsher than what we are facing, but nevertheless, Paul was attracting them to that which was of great value to them. We do not know what lies ahead in terms of the timing of end time events. We all know as Christians, we preach about the end time events, we talk about it, we say so much about it, but we don't know. In Matthew 24, well, I remember the disciples, were, they were asking Jesus Christ privately, what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? His response in verses 6 through to 9 of that Matthew 24 was, And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes. We all agree that coronavirus is an example of a pestilence, isn't it? When the Bible talks about pestilences in diverse places, isn't it? When we're talking about coronavirus, diverse places across the entire globe, it's almost in almost every country, bar a few. So that's, we can see that this is an end time event. So the Bible then in diverse places in verse 8, all these are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you and shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. I guess we do not know the timing of this verse 9. We're not necessarily saying that is the case. The Bible says the beginning of sorrows. Again, we don't know how much in the beginning. Is it really the beginning? That's all God's prerogative. But as Christians, we want to be wise people. And um, the, the, the key here is it's saying, then they shall be delivered, you ought to be afflicted. That means there's a time when Christians in the end times, what we read in 1 Peter was at the very beginning of the church. But at the end time of the church, while God will be moving, I believe, in great ways, it's also going to be a time of affliction. It's going to be a time when the church will go through a lot. And that's what it's kind of saying, and shall kill you and shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Now, when we can feel those kind of reverberations that things like this might happen, Paul was, as he was admonishing the church at that time, is, he said that this time, it's a time to focus on what is of much value to the Christians. And then we go back to our reading, our actually Bible reading text. Maybe I'll focus on verses 3 to 4 of um, 1 Peter chapter 3. Whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plaiting the hair and of wearing of gold or of putting on of apparel. I guess what he was trying to, Paul was, Peter was trying to do here was, you people have gone through a lot. You're going through a lot of pain. Then don't lose sight of the big picture. This is the time to focus on that which is of value to you as a Christian. He said, you are adorning. He said, let it not be of plaiting the hair. Of course, plaiting the hair, there's nothing wrong in plaiting the hair. He wasn't kind of condemning it. But in a relative sense, where should your focus be? Where should your value be? He was mentioning it to them, not of plaiting the hair or of, um, um, or of uh, wearing of gold or of wearing of apparel. Apparel is clothing. Of course, we need to put on clothes. But it's very possible that in those days as it is now that maybe people were spending a lot more attention, a lot more money, maybe perhaps, maybe I don't know, but it's possible 
that it became something of value to them. The clothing they wore, the apparel they put on, you know, the way they kind of, perhaps maybe the house we live in, perhaps the degrees we have, that's all about outward adornment too. They may not be immediate, but those things that define us. He said, remove your focus from that. Treat those as if they are passing away. Treat those as if one day they are fleeting. And he said, Lord, you are adorning. So it's true, as I said. Let's keep a, 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 you know, expressing empathy. It's, it's needed. As long as we're in this body of clay, as long as we're in this flesh, we need that as believers. We need to continue to do that because that's what strengthened us. That's what put, keeps us together, you know, and, and, and that's needful. But it's saying here that um, we should focus. He said, but let it be the hidden man of the heart. The adorning should be of the hidden man of the heart. It was referring to the man you can imagine. Maybe there's, there's, there was, a, there was um, a graphic which the AV might, might show us. That the hidden man, that man is not shown. This outward man, this is our outward man. The physical man is the outward man. That is on display. Everyone sees it. Whichever way you cannot decorate it, the ornaments that you put on it, whichever way it's seen. But he said, the focus of your adornment, that which is of value, should be that which no man sees but God sees. Only God sees. The hidden man of the heart. It's hidden. It's in there. But it's hidden. Let your adorning be of that. And you can imagine some of the outcomes of that, which he says, is that which is not corruptible. Even the you know, when it says not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is of, in the sight of God, of great price. There are some key words there. Not corruptible. This outward man is corruptible. One day, we'll grow up, we'll die, isn't it? It will decay, we will die, and the body will decay in the grave. You said, but it said, this one, the hidden man, is incorruptible. It will live forever. So let your adorning be focused on that, which is going to lead not corrupt to even the ornament. Can you imagine this? Of course, I've got a jacket on. I've got everything. Even my wife, you know, she gave me lots of warnings before I left home because she knows sometimes I could be a little bit careless. My time might be that way or whatever. You know, in terms of make sure you're smart. That's needful. We're not necessarily discounting that. Extremely important. We need to look smart. We need to look nice beautiful, handsome, or whatever. That's him. But in comparison to the hidden man of the heart, let's ornament that. And one of the ornaments of the hidden man of the heart, he said, is a meek and quiet spirit. When that's ornamented, the outcome, the fruit it will yield is a meek and quiet spirit. You can imagine that, a meekness and quiet spirit which he says there, which in the sight of God is of great price. Whatever we expend on our outward man, there's a price tag to it, isn't it? If you buy a new property, there's a price tag. If you buy a car, there's a price tag to it. If you're educated, whatever you do, there's a price tag to it. So, but that's that same price tag that God, who is investing in us, says that if we can yield that of a meek and quiet spirit, for example, as far as God is concerned, is of a great price. We are worth more than gold. We are of worth a great price. That is says, he's saying there we should focus our attention on that, um, that which is incorruptible. Because the outward man in relation is seen, you can see it, it's temporal. You know, we, we lost a very beloved sister that we're all still feeling the pain and everything. It shows that we are temporal. We are seen. We are, we are corruptible. We, we will corrupt away. But then the hidden man, they said, is unseen and internal. It's incorruptible. It's imperishable. It's something that abideth forever. He said, let our focus, even in times like this, let us focus more on that. I mean, in 1 Peter 1, um, 23 to 25, I'll probably just paraphrase. I said, being born again, those of us who are born again, say, being born again, not of corruptible seed. What it's saying is that before you were born again, and as we are, that outward man is corruptible. It's corruptible and will perish. But the 
when we're born again, there's a seed that's been planted that's incorruptible. That seed cannot be corrupted. It's incorruptible um, by the word of God, which liveth and bideth forever. It's that word we heard, isn't it? Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. That word of life we heard, we absorbed, and we prayed our way through to salvation, and it germinated a seed. A seed was born inside there, and that seed is incorruptible. And he was now doing a comparison in the next set. For all flesh is as grass. You know, when we look at grass, it's beautiful, isn't it? Grass is nice. When you look at green grass, very, very nice. But grass, at some point, it fades away, doesn't it? It withers away. He said, that is grass. So at some point, maybe even between winter and summer, you know, grass kind of, it gets rid of it. But it looks very nice. And he said, the glory of man is like flower that comes out of that grass. The glory of man, when we adorn ourselves, that's the glory of man. That really is the glory of man. What defines us, which is good. There are good things, but we're looking at comparison now. He says, that glory really is going to pass away. That glory at some point, you know, we might grow, go to middle age, when we become senior citizens and begin to do that. Actually, we begin to see that that things begin to change, isn't it? Our makeup changes completely. The things that were sort of great, this thing, maybe sometimes we'll be, we told even our over 70s, who are probably not that old, really, to perhaps maybe stay at home because of coronavirus. That's just an example, not to talk of over 80s or over 90s. At that point, you'll be even asking that. I, I remember, was it Brian L. Phillips in Portland? They were asking him a question, you know, you enjoy. He said, well, he really prefers to be with the Lord if the Lord wants to call him home. That, um, that it, the body's aching a bit more. He said it's aching. He said he's enjoying the Lord, no doubt. But his desire is to be with the Lord because this body of clay is beginning to have its toll. That is about our outward man. That's why it says in comparison, let us focus on that. Let us focus on that. And the flesh, the, the grass, you know, the flower, that, even that glory, it looks like a flower. You know, flower is beautiful. When you look at, you know, different kinds of uh, flower, daffodils, whatever you call it, they, they're nice, they're wonderful. But at some point, it fades away. And that is man. We will fade away. That's why I said, let your adorning not be of the outward, but focus on that. Um, in Ephesians um, 4.24, it says, And that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. That's a, new, that's a hidden man. When we put on that, let's focus more. At this time, at this end time, let's focus more on that. The hidden man of the heart. He says in, in 2 Corinthians 4, it says, For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. Again, what he's trying to say is the outward man, you know, he, there's a recognition. We need to recognize that this outward man, whether sometimes when we're sick or going through a lot of hardship and things are ebbing away, we might use that scripture. But also, even when we are well, we know in a relative sense, by the time those of us maybe, if you, by the time you get to your 40s, hitting 50s, 60s, you begin to count down, feel that look at some point, that outward man gradually begins to perish. The same health you had as a teenager, it's not going to be the same in the 30s or maybe from 40s, things begin to happen. That we've got to take some extra care. By the time you hit your 60s, mm -hmm, 70s, 80s, and the rest is just the mercy of God who decides to keep one alive a bit more or some maybe, maybe a bit further. And what it's saying here is that in that kind of this thing, that the reasons why we're born again is because of eternity. We were born again to inherit a tent and then focus our value on things that will build up the hidden man. That's pretty much what he was trying to tell us here. He, he imagine the issue about, um, he said, a meek and quiet spirit. I mean, the, the point here is the Bible says, by their fruits, ye shall know them, isn't it? That's the scriptures. And sometimes, we sometimes define Christianity as, okay, we all come to church, we all fellowship with one another, but if the fruits of Christianity, if that meek and quiet spirit as an example isn't there, then that which is valuable to what we are made of, we're not focusing on it. And if we're not focusing on it, then the chances are 
We may not inherit that eternal blessing, but God forbid. We pray God to really help us. So that, that's the point he was trying to say that um, let's, where God resides, where his attention is, let's focus our attention more on that. In, in, in that verse 4, he said, not, um, in the sight of God is of much, much um, value. It's a great price. means we should focus our attention on that, the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit. When we talk about meekness in behavior, Meekness in behavior is, meekness is, a, is our behavior towards others. When God has worked in us, meekness, it's someone who has no self-will. Your self-will is got no self-interest. You are ready to kind of just take pain, to suffer pain. You're ready to kind of, um, you know, suffer for the sake of Christ. Even among believers, you're ready to do it so that that meekness, that je- meekness leads to gentleness. When you are meek, and you, that, that's meekness is what gives you a quiet spirit. Where some people will be railing and ranting and raving, you're quiet. Because God has actually done a bit of work in us. Um, meekness is always associated with humility. There is no way someone can be humble without being meek. Meekness actually is what defines humility. Because, you know, we, we, all, we, all, we all have that self in us. Whether we like it or not, we have self-interest. It's just natural. But when you bury that and say, God, thy will are not mine. Not my desire, but yours. That is when circumstances happen, the outcome will be meekness. The outcome will be quietness. And that's no wonder in those scriptures, if you look at that First Peter chapter 3, when it says, likewise ye wives, what he's saying there is said, being subjected to your own husbands. I mean, we need to understand the context here. They were going through hardship now. There's a tendency in the home that things may want to erupt. It's possible. We, those of us who are married knows that, um, you know, things can happen. But he's saying, as a wife, if you've got that meek and quiet spirit, if your focus is on that value, he was saying that um, what's likely to happen is that um, you'll be in subjection to your wives. That that's when your own your, your husbands who may not be saved or who perhaps may be backslidden or maybe need some help spiritually can be won by the conversation of their wives. That is a point he was trying to actually make here. While they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. Means you've got something about you. The way you converse, the way you speak, the man will know that this is not the natural, the outward wife. This is something born of that inward man. This is something born of what she's made of. That is what really quenches, you know, some potential fires in the home. He said that, focus on that, you. And he was saying in in, in verse um, in in verse three, uh, who's adorning? Let it not be the outward man of the platinum of the yeah. Let it be the hidden man of the heart. In verse five, for after this manner in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves being in subjection to their own husbands. What it means there is, it's not easy for a woman to be subject to their husband, to submissive, unless the inward man, from a Christian perspective, when God has done some work inside. So they were giving an example of people like Sarah, the way they actually conducted themselves with their husband, because they adorned themselves with that which is of much value to God. And as they had done themselves, the outcome, the result was, it was just such a peaceful home. A home that had respect for one another. Imagine what he was saying in verse 5 there. For after, you know, in verse 6, verse 7, sorry. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor to the wife as unto the weaker vessel. What it's saying here is, no matter what your wife might be also, that if that man really has that inward adornment, as that meek and quiet spirit, not automatically you will dwell with your wife according to knowledge. That would just happen. Somehow, you wouldn't be that man that's full of ego that wants to have your way. Somehow, Christ has predominated. And then, sometimes maybe you might see us, you know, because um, Eve was the weaker vessel, you know, way, way back in the Garden of Eden, whichever way. You can see it in that perspective and you're rather praying for your wife. You're rather actually just saying, God, maybe somehow you know how to quench these potential fires. And God, as we do God's will, God has a way of doing it, doesn't he? Because God is marvelous. So everyone has their role to play. But if that man hasn't adorned himself 
with that inward adornment. It doesn't come automatically. It doesn't. If, you're not, if you allow the outward man that perishes to have the upper hand, then you will yield the fruits of the flesh. Or the works of the flesh is what to come out, and that's not going to be yielding what Christianity is all about. So that was what he was trying to say. And even in verse 8, he was saying that in verse 8, Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Imagine that. He's saying to all the brethren now, everyone, you know, he said, be ye all of one mind. If you're all adorning yourselves with that inward adornment, we all meek, we've got that meek and quiet spirit. He said, you will have compassion one of another. It will just happen. We'll be compassionate towards each other. We'll say love as brethren. Imagine in the family. Sometimes I liken to the love in the family among um, children, siblings. When there's some, a, a true home, they naturally love themselves. And when things go wrong, they know how to fix it, don't they? He said love as brethren. As the members of the family of God, when we just love each other. He said be pitiful. Pitiful means someone may, might, might have even erred. Be pitiful. So be, be courteous. You know, courtesy, very, very important. The way we act and relate to one another. Courtesy, if the world knows courtesy, I believe Christians should epitomize courtesy more than the world can ever do. If it's lacking in the church, then there's something lacking in our Christian graces. It should really manifest in such a big way among those of us professing to be Christians. He said, courteous. He said, love has been not rendering evil for evil. Which means it's possible that evil may come to you. It may come from within or without. But don't respond back. He said, no, don't do that. He said, he said um, not rendering or no um, railing for railing. Things may happen whereby, you, you know, the flesh in you would say, no. He said, contrary wise, blessing. The, it's the inward man. It's the hidden man of the heart that can produce that. Our outward man, our natural man cannot produce that. That's what it says we should do. And as we prepare for glory land, that's the kind of attitude we should have. And we pray God to help us to have. I mean, look at the lesson we studied today. Look at the, you know, when David was being, you know, almost driven out by his son Absalom. David's all trance is, you know, just leave it. They were trying to bring the act. He said, no, 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 take it back to the city. He just left it to God. That's an example of the hidden man in the heart, you know, working. He just left it to God. He said, God, have your way. And when Shimei, we know when he came abusing and cursing, and someone said, look, are we going to allow this? Let's act. He said, no, 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 no. I'm in God's hands. Maybe God has allowed it. Let, 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 let it happen. That's okay. You, you, you can see here, someone who there's no self with no self-interest. He just committed, committed himself to him he was able to assess, to, to deal with the situation. That's, that's, that's an example of meekness. That's, an, that's what can lead to that beauty of quietness. And that's what the Bible is enjoining us to do. Um, it, it's that, um, you, you know, we can adorn ourselves, adorn the outward man, or adorn the inner man. There's nothing wrong in adorning the outward man. That's why the Bible says do it in a modest way. That's why the Bible was promoting modesty. Modesty means that you wouldn't go beyond limits. You're modest. Bang. Focus on the, the inner man. That's what's going to be to God of great price. That's what's going to produce not the me factor, but the God factor. It's not about me as a person because there's nothing good in me. I know that. It is my yielding to God that's going to be produce fruits of Christianity. That is when people can glorify our Father. They can behold those good works and glorify our Father which is in heaven. And that's what the Bible was enjoining us to do. As we kind of um, wrap up this, we, let, let's look at Ephesians chapter 3 verse 14. It says, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he will grant you according to the riches of his glory. Imagine that. There are riches in glory. There are spiritual riches. There's so much that God wants to do for us. You know, Paul was bowing his knees to the Ephesian church because he knew that God, what God wants to make of us is un unimaginable. The, the beauty, that song says, let the beauty of Jesus Christ be seen in me. If we allow him, he will make our lives beautiful. 
there will be something about us that will just be beautiful. People will just behold it and be attracted to Christianity. We are supposed to be show, showcased. We are supposed to be God's workmanship that needs to be showcased to the world to say, look, this is examples of what Christianity is all about. If we don't get that, we've got nothing really. All we've got is profession. Without fruit, our church, being a member of the positive, doesn't define us. It doesn't. It's the fruit that we get through being a member because we thank God for what we receive, but it was, it's what comes out of it that, that, that defines us. Otherwise, you know, it's, it's like going to, you know, those of us who came from Nigeria, we used to, there used to be this kind of, um, maybe not independent school, the likes of grammar schools in, in Nigeria. Great, great schools. You might go to one of them and still, you know, fail your exams, your GCSEs. Of course, you're not it's not intended for you to fail it, but it's still possible. Places like King's College that uh, Francis can relate to. Yes, a lot of them will do well, but some of them still don't, don't make it. So it's not the church. It's about what we get out of it. What we get about God working in our hearts that really matters most. So he said, um, according to riches in glory, to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. That is God's prayer for us. We want to be strengthened in our inner man. We want God to put something there that produces fruit constantly, perennially, all the time, that makes our wife see us and say, that my husband is a godly man. My wife is a godly woman. That is what, that's when Christianity is in action. Without that, it, it's mere profession. It's mere hypocrisy. It's nothing more than hypocrisy. Without that, without fruit, no matter what we are, I might even be a minister and be a hypocrite. It's very possible. Because after all, our leaders are not, they are not God. They, they can't see through. It's only God that sees through. Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love. That's what we want, isn't it? We want to be rooted. You know, imagine to go into those roots, to root you, to ground you. Say, God, let your love swell me. Let it envelop me. There's riches in Christ that come, so that we may comprehend both the depth, the height, the breadth. You imagine it. He was saying all that, that we may comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge. We acquire knowledge by listening to the word of God, isn't it? We are quite, but the love of Christ in the heart, it passes knowledge. I mean, some of the things we spoke about of our dearest and beloved and sister Rena, who's gone to glory land now, she wasn't a minister, was she? She wasn't even a worker. You know, but we, we, could see, we could see the love of Christ that emanated from her life. It passes knowledge. Some people may not even quote the Bible as some of us can quote. But the beauty of Jesus Christ is just radiating through them. That is it, that's the love of Christ that we may have it, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Isn't that what we want? We want all the fullness of God. Eternity is a pure place. It's a great place. It's not, you see, I, I, I was a bit careful. I wasn't trying to focus on, you know, we should dress this way or that way. No. Focus on the inner man. When we focus there, the rest will take care of itself. Sure. When we focus on that, God will guide us. God will tell us what is right. But if we focus on the outward man, we may please the church, but we may not please God. But when we please God, definitely it's God's church who will please the church. There's no way about it. But the focus should be on the inner man. Because the Pharisees, outwardly, they had everything. They fulfilled everything. But they were nothing before God. We don't want that. But God is going to help us. We will, of course, sing the closing song now, which is... Um, Sir Comfort will lead us just as I am without one plea. And we do want to encourage everyone to spend some time on their knees in their respective homes. And as Brian Isaac said, we've got two places per, per bench on the altar. And may the Lord bless us.
help us to be faithful to you too in bearing out those fruits, those fruits of meekness, those fruits of love, the joy, the peace, the gentleness, the goodness, the patience, the long-suffering, the meekness, the faith. Oh, Lord, help us to be true to you. Oh, God, help us to have in our hearts and in our sights and in our mind the end, oh, God, the end that you have for us, the end that you are bringing us to. Lord, do this and more. Help us to meet with you, Lord, no matter what the challenge is, no matter what may come, because only you know what is ahead. Oh, but we know that with you, who holds tomorrow, oh God, we can move forward with confidence, we can move forward with faith, we can move forward with hope, and we're looking up to you to perfect your will in us. Do this and more, for in Jesus' name we pray.